you start your own country or city, you reap the consequences. Welcome back to the Hidden History Happy Hour, my friend Alex. Brother Cunningham, how are you? I am very excited that we're getting back to our roots again, just you and me, as many and many of our fans have requested. And I'm going to now do what I've always promised to do and never fulfilled. Alex, tell the story. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm going to tell the story of uh, a capital that nobody ever is able to guess. Um, it, my pub country, quiz. we love pub quizzes. Today's pub question is, um, what is the only city to have been a European capital that is not in Europe? Mm. And the answer, I pause for a moment, congratulate yourself if you paused the video, and if you got it right, well done. Yeah, write it down, people, no cheating. The answer is Rio de Janeiro. And the explanation is this. Napoleon uh, was pushing into uh, the Iberian Peninsula in what became known as the Peninsula War. And that was going worryingly well uh, for Napoleon and the French. Uh, well, at least worryingly well if you were a member of the Portuguese nobility. Uh, and they, in 1807, fearing the worst, the court of Portugal decamped to their colony of Brazil. And they made Rio de Janeiro, some 5,000 miles away from home, the capital of Portugal. And now poor old Rio isn't even the capital of Brazil. Pub quiz two, anyone? what is the capital of Brazil? Uh, you tell us. Brasilia. Uh, <laughs> which, but, which I do get right, because it's, it's like one of those planned cities like Canberra or something. I get right, that but, answer. Go on, go on. Well, my question is, is someone defending portugal at this point or are they just yeah, well, waiting for uh, to come you'll in be and take it over? surprised to know because we were at war with everybody at one time or other <laughs> it was the british uh who were at war against the, the, the french with with gallant um iberian allies and, and your um, oldest alliance the portugal. oldest not just our oldest alliance the longest continuous alliance in the world between britain and portugal and um so poor old rio isn't even the capital of, of brazil anymore brasilia is and i always misspell brasilia i always spell it with uh, um a, a Z, Brasilia an with an S, S uh, but I spell it with a Z because Two that was the name of a nightclub night in very inverted commas <laughs> in my hometown in, in Barry St. Edmunds where I grew up. It was, it was a, like a terrapin hut uh, where sweat. No, well, no, 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 wait, 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 hold on, hold on. I got to do a little callback. So you're yeah. saying you would go from this terrapin hut in Barry St. Edmunds to look at the leather skin covered Bible. Correct. <laughs> that was like a Saturday <laughs> night for you. That was a big night <laughs> in Suffolk. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so. Uh, Rio, for a time, was capital of Brazil and capital of Portugal. And when the Peninsular War was over, of course, the people of Portugal said, um, King, come on home. Uh, the realm shouldn't be permanently run from a colony. The problem was that everyone at court rather liked Rio. So King John VI uh, therefore promptly upgraded Brazil to a kingdom. So there. It's not a monarchy running things from a colony anymore. Uh, long live the United Kingdom of Portugal, Brazil, and the Algarves. I mean, what a holiday sweet destination it And was. therefore, you could have your capital in the Algarves if you, you want. have it wherever you like. But unsurprisingly, nobody bought this. You've got to come back, John, they said. Uh, we're Portugal. You're the king of Portugal. That's how things work. He dragged it out, but in, in the end, uh, facing a potential revolution at home. Uh, a mere seven years after the close of hostilities in the Peninsular War, the court returned to Lisbon, and King John left his son, Prince Pedro, to leave uh, to lead things in in Brazil in his absence. And uh -huh. Pedro took that responsibility rather more seriously than I think his father had envisaged, because a year after John and the court had left, uh, Pedro declared Brazil independent, uh, restyled himself Emperor of Brazil, and established his capital at Rio. Uh, and you know, generally waved two fingers towards faraway Europe and his father, a father. Uh, the lesson or from one this... finger, as we would do here in the US. Yes, okay. Two, actually, going back to an episode that we've recently done, two fingers, the just two finger gesture in my country supposedly comes from archery. Uh, you know, yes. you gesture to the French. I've still got my fingers for archery practice, for arch, for not sorry, not archery Kill practice, one, yeah. for archery, yeah. archery. Um, so the lesson I draw from this story, Brian, is that daddy issues should never be underestimated in the fates of nations. And yet, I can't help but call out the contradiction. Maybe it's not a contradiction. You had a bit of a downward attitude towards daddy issues in the most recent James Bond series also. 
Yeah, it's it's weak in the plot of a of a series that's Spy been thriller. turned yeah. into a weird, weepy, woke shadow of itself. <laughs> it's a relevant point to make in the way it plays out in the Game of Thrones. Now, I, I, just to ensure I'm not accused of manipulating things for a punchline, uh, history records it, that Pedro, in fact, hated his mother much more than he hated his father. <laughs> but, uh, but it's still, he certainly clearly didn't get on with, well with either of them. And how old was he? This is not a trick, but how old was he when he took took the throne? Oh, yeah, good question. He was a young man. I mean, we, so an we, adolescent or? Uh, no, or, no, no, or, no. He uh, was, okay, a grown young man. Uh, but we, we bear in mind that um, it's, uh, people came to the thrones of countries at yeah. very young ages, of, of course, and would sometimes be wards and so forth. I don't think there's any suggestion that Pedro was manipulated by clever viziers pulling the wool over the eyes of honest Prince Pedro. He wanted no to be emperor of his own gig. No Rasputin uh, in the background. I can just only imagine my my 23-year-old daughter saying in a, in a parchment letter, of course, that would take three weeks to reach me across the sea, Father, I know your invitation to come home came from a place of love. It came from a place of love. <laughs> but I'm perfectly happy running Brazil. So Not only am much. I happy here, but uh, you ain't in charge no more. Yeah, here's a question. It's, it's a little surprising to me that there would have been a mechanism in those days for the people of Portugal to demand that their sovereign return. I assume this must have been wow. sort of like the landed gentry, right? Well, A, that, and B, it looked like there was going to be a revolution if he didn't come back. So, you know, it was, but I guess that's what, I guess that's, what's surprising to me. How many revolutions have been started because they wanted a monarch, not the other way around. Well, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Countries fates change with the life and death of single individuals and uh, the symbolic power of of monarchy in in that time was, was very strong. And indeed for for a long, long time before that, and and some will say a good deal after that, but um, it's plain that, you know, the, the death of uh, Henry V changes the course yeah. of, of things in, in my country. It's plain that the death of Richard the Lionheart changes things enormously uh, when you get John uh, after that. And I think that um, in my reading of history, the it's very easy to criticize the great man theory and think that all things depend on an individual uh, and what he or she has done. But um, actually, the symbolism of these people does do, do yeah. really matter. And if you are 5,000 miles away and peace has been restored to the realm, it's not just, it's unlikely just to be a revolution with the proletariat rising up. Um, it, it's going to be led by another aspirant to the throne, another, another nobleman. And he had to go home to put that down. Well, and it's not completely irrelevant today, right? Um, Zelensky is in Ukraine very careful about being seen as being outside the country of Ukraine at any particular moment, because the symbolism of weakness might tempt people to take matters into their own hands. Yep. Well, look, that is one way that you can establish your own hegemony over a significant or insignificant part of the earth, but you have a more modern story. I think on any reading, Brazil is a significant part of of the uh, of the globe and what i'm about to talk about is not uh, uh this is the story of Sealand and its great ruler prince roy and no matter how uh far-fetched it may sound this story is true <laughs> roy bates was british at least to begin with and he had served uh his country and mine uh, in the second world war with distinction um his jaw had been shattered by a german bomb uh, before he married a beauty queen he was uh, quite the um, he was quite the man, and having recovered from his war injuries and married the girl of his dreams, uh, Roy, as plain old Roy as he was then, uh, became a pirate radio host. And th- these are unlicensed radio uh, stations that operated uh, in Arg R R R, and um, in that capacity, he and others saw the attraction uh, of these these strange things, offshore sea forts, the Mornsall mm-hmm. sea forts, which had been um, built in the Second World War um, for the defense, as the name might imply, uh, in the sea to protect our east coast ports and places where, like where I'm from um, in, in Suffolk, off the coast of Felixstowe and so forth, and to protect the entrance to the Thames estuary. And to state the obvious, a platform out at sea is rather hard to police, uh, certainly for your t- domestic territorial uh, police force. 
So some might think those rather bleak and windswept oil rig type affairs. And indeed, to the uninformed eye, that's what they might look like. <laughs> but to Roy, if you don't they, have vision, if you don't, you don't have, have if you don't have vision yeah. to Roy, they were the promised land. So he first set up a shop on something called Knock John Fort, um, which is about nine nautical miles off the coast of Essex. And soon his eyes were drawn to a greater prize, HM4 Ruffs. Uh, and Ruffs is a mere six nautical miles off the coast of Suffolk, rather a little more convenient, therefore, uh, but still a magic number. Um, in 1966, he seized Ruffs with a fellow adventurer called Ronan O'Reilly, who ran Not too much of, resistance, I'm guessing, right? Well, there was still some, there were some oh, guys on right. there, right? All there right. was there was another bunch of guys doing pirate radio and they kicked them out bodily. All right. uh, and Ronan ran something called Radio Caroline, which is very popular in, in my country as a pirate radio. For, so I remember it as a child. I remember it still existing. But that town wasn't big enough for the both of them. And soon enough, uh, Ronan and Roy had fallen out and Roy booted Ronan out too. Ronan O'Reilly uh, rounded up some tough lads and they attempted to retake Fort Ruffs in 1967. Uh, but our Roy was having none of it. And with guns and petrol bombs, the pretenders to the uh, to, to the title of, of Fort Ruffs were swiftly repelled. And alarmed by what was going on, quite reasonably, Royal Marines and our Royal Navy were uh, sent out to investigate what was going on in Ruffs. Uh, Prince Roy's son, Prince Michael, uh, persuaded these usurpers, representative of the armed forces of the United Kingdom, uh, to abandon their approach with warning shots. And well, they must have thought, well, what the hell's going on here? Are we in the right or not? They claimed, uh, Roy Bates and family claimed that these waters were theirs. They were outside the territorial waters of the UK, six miles out, and HM Ruffs was no more. It was now the Principality of Sealand. Why uh, wasn't he a king? Why was he only a prince? Modesty alone can explain <laughs> the downgrading, I think. Okay. Um, and they declared that they were entitled to defend it. And both, to the surprise of all watchers, of course, both of the noble princes of Sealand were arrested uh, by the British authorities and charged with firearms offences. But hurrah for Sealand. Those charges were dismissed. For as the court uh, realised in its wisdom, these were international affairs. And Sealand was outside the rules that apply to UK uh, firearms mm -hmm. regulations. They were outside of the territorial limits. Plainly, therefore, Prince Roy maintained, this vindicates my claim uh, to be a, an independent country. And, and the dismissal of these piddling false charges uh, vindicates uh, recognition of my country. Now, whether I or not... An I feel an accept coming. Well, uh, look, spoiler, whether or not anyone else recognized it, they didn't. Uh, he argued he was entitled now to behave uh, as he did. Sealand started, you know, and to behave as a, as a ruler. Sealand started issuing passports, uh, rather a lot of them, in fact, rather more than you might think could um, live atop an oil rig type affair a few miles off the coast. Um, they adopted for itself an anthem and a flag and so on, the kind of thing that groups do when they're pretending to be uh, a country. Yeah. Stamps, of course, that's always stamps. Uh, and sadly, the police charges that they faced were not the end of the challenges to yeah. the righteous rule of Prince Roy. There was a German businessman called Alexander Achenbach uh, who sought, this is in 1968 now, so Prince Roy has, re has, has reigned for, for 10 years, uh, sought to engineer a deal with Prince Roy in which they'd build a luxury hotel and a casino on top of this oil rig type of fair. Sure. I mean, it sounds really attractive, doesn't it? But you will be very surprised to hear it didn't come off. And Achenbach did not take failure well. He styled himself the Prime Minister of Sealand. And this treacherous dog lured Prince Roy away from the Principality on a false business lead. And he hired Dutch and German mercenaries. Remember, this is true. He hired Dutch and German mercenaries to help him conquer Sealand in a putsch in Prince Roy's absence. They stormed the kingdom by jet ski. Uh, they stormed the kingdom with speedboats <laughs> and helicopters and they took control and at constitutional outrage, they took Prince Michael prisoner. 
I mean, this, yeah. is, this is an affront to uh, Prince Roy's honour and gallantry. Yeah. But such insurrectionists were no match uh, for our Prince Roy. I mean, he faced down the Germans at Monte Cassino, and that was no small affair. So yes. these mercenary running dogs were nothing in comparison with what he'd done. And they had underestimated the resources of Sealand. Uh, no one knew it uh, as Prince Roy did. And he chartered a helicopter of his own. Our gallant hero regains access to the kingdom and to a cache of weapons that he had hidden therein. And single-handedly, I think, I don't think he had any help at this stage, single-handedly, he then dispatches uh, these outrageous uh, rebels in no uncertain terms. Did he terms. kill people? Did he kill people? Did no, no loss, of, yeah. no loss of life, although okay, it would have good. been better than these, these dogs deserved. Uh, <laughs> Prince Michael was freed <laughs> and the aggressors were tamed. But the point is, he didn't just see off the mercenaries. This wasn't just a case of foreign hostility, Brian. It was treason because yeah. Achenbach had a Sealand passport. Sure. Well, the rest of those invaders were released, but Achenbach was imprisoned in Sealand's highest tower. I mean, it doesn't have a highest tower, but you know, just go with the metaphor. He was imprisoned. Now, plainly, hanging would be too good for such a traitor, but uh, oh. such was the graciousness of Prince Roy that rather than the swift execution that he swiftly merited, uh, he just kept him as a prisoner and began negotiations with the German government for the fiend's release. And negotiate the Germans did. Well, plainly, this demonstrates once again the validity of the claim to a kingdom. Sure. He was entering you can't negotiate with a non-country. Sovereign discourse, sovereign negotiations. His claims must be true. By the grace of Roy, Achenbach was released and returned to Germany. Only to go on to claim to be the head of government in exile, the Sealand rebel rebel government. Right? This, this dog knew no, uh, knew no honor at all. Now, totally coincidentally, uh, around this time, uh, Britain, oh, sorry, a little, little later in 87, not, uh, Britain extended its territorial waters claim from three miles, that is to say, doesn't cover roughs, Sealand, uh, to 12 miles. And the principality now found itself claimed to be in British waters. And obviously, that could only have been motivated by Britain's concerns about the rising power of its neighbour, Sealand. It is irrelevant. Not reinforcement. Exactly. It is completely irrelevant to point out that every country on the face of the earth recognised Britain's right. claim to Sealand under the laws well, of the and, sea. And, also details, around, details. And, and all the other countries increased to 12 miles, too. Correct. But that's details, yeah. too. It was all plainly <laughs> to do with the rising power of yeah. Sealand. But neither the uh, machinations of the pretender Achenbach nor the claims of authority over Sealand by other states like Britain, Sealand's rival, of course, uh, were obstacles to the principality's success. Internet domain schemes flourished, uh, passport sales, of course, accreditation to loyal new citizens who might take advantage of the uh, arrangements of, of citizenship. Favorable this, tax this place. situation. Indeed. Stamps, coins, peerages, started issuing peerages within the realm, this, the realm of Sealand. There was no end to Sealand's bounty. But Brian, uh, after many happy years of, of this, I'm afraid tragedy struck uh, the realm not once, but several uh, times. We bear in mind, of course, that um, he had first taken what became Sealand, but was then Ruffs, in 1966. We're now in 2006. Prince Roy has reigned for 40 years, and I'm afraid a fire broke out on Sealand. And as a percentage of territory damaged, it must be one of the worst disasters ever to befall a country. And it rendered much of Sealand a blighted waste. Uninhabitable. Um, indeed. And then in 2012, Prince Roy died. Um, mm. Prince Michael, of course, has, uh, had reigned in, for some time as Prince Regent because his father had been unwell. But I'm afraid that the founding uh, leader's passing seemed a mortal blow to the energies of Sealand. Rather poignantly and sadly, its flag was, uh, was planted on Everest by a, uh, a loyal follower of Sealand, but uh, that was little recompense. Sealand carries on today, Brian. Its prince reigns in absentia uh, as he runs a cockle fishing business in Leon Sea, uh, which from all accounts is a very nice part of the world. Uh, its sports teams remain accredited. It still enters sports in competitions amongst unrecognized nations. Film rights to this tale are often discussed, and I'm willing to entertain them too, not that I have any rights to, uh, to seize it, but then Prince Roy's magnificent example shows that <laughs> rights to seizing something is not the point. Uh, yes, but I'm afraid sir. one fears that when it comes to Sealand, things can never be the same uh, without the magnificent major, our late, much lamented Prince Roy. 
Prince Roy. Prince Roy. So can a person visit Sealand today? It's a very good question. I bet you could if you were willing to spend a bit on take it. Your own, is, take your own boat 12 miles out. Hard to believe, but or there is no miles. there's no there's no charter flight. Uh and uh, it's only obviously a demonstration of Britain's jealousy that there's no regular um flight from Heathrow. But uh you you would have to uh enter into arrangements with Prince Michael to uh, be granted access uh, and if you get there I fear what you would find is a burnt out shell um, so there ain't anything there's that much to see uh, but if you went through those maneuvers you probably could be granted diplomatic access Brian a man as distinguished as yourself with a legacy of service would probably be allowed. yeah but how great would it be to do a live episode from the top of the highest tower of Sealand I tell you what if we it'd be uh, cold make- yeah, it'd be cold. If we make it to 100 episodes, we should aim to do it on Sealand, not least because it was the home of pirate radio for many years. And yeah. the, that tradition of recording on there is actually a rather great one. That is worthy of a episode in and of itself. Pirate radio in the UK. Some of our viewers know that I'm a somewhat lapsed uh, drummer. And um, maybe we'd even have a jam session on top of the, t- the highest tower. I forgot to mention, Alex, uh, Relevant to nothing, I guess, I'm enjoying some teeling Irish whiskey today. I'm still on the same gin that uh, we had a few episodes ago because we hadn't talked about which what we were going to drink <laughs> yes. uh, on this one. Givine is my drink uh, today. Uh, it's a grape-based gin, and I like it very much. But I'm about to switch to uh, the Mouse Hall gin. And this is ah. very interesting because, and it's another grape-based um, uh, gin, it's a, it's a South African transplant, transplanted family making gin in the UK from the off products of their grapes, of their grape harvest. And they are harvesting wine in the UK, which is an increasingly successful business. People yeah, always yeah. claim that the strata of land is the is sort of the same quality as the best wine growing areas in France, which is why a lot of champagne growers buy up areas in um, in, in southern England. So when I have the mouse all gin, I will report back. Well, maybe grape-based gin will be more agreeable to me. I guess we'll. we'll I, I think you'd out. like it. I, I'm willing to uh, put some in you and find out. I would much rather experience that than try to start our own country on a abandoned uh, oil well. No reason whatever. you can't do both. All right, my friend, listeners, this has been pure undistilled H4 you've enjoyed today. Let us know what you think, and until next time, cheers. Cheers. cheers.